<coughs> Hi, Chair Galvin. Do you want to do a camera check briefly? Hi, Chair Galvin, do you want to do a brief camera and audio check? Sure. Okay, I heard you and I see you. Okie doke, great, thank you. And I see you, Board Member Walsh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, it's nice to hear you. Looks like we're just waiting for board member Grable. Is that correct, um, Secretary Manis? That is correct. Okay. And he's just now being promoted. Chair Galvin, we are also just waiting for our city attorney to uh, enter council chamber. Thank you, we'll hold off. Looks like we're ready, Secretary Manis. Chair Galvin, we are still waiting for our city attorney to enter council chamber. Oh, I thought I saw him sit down, I'm sorry. That was our assistant city manager, Jason Nutt. Ah, uh, he's sitting in a different spot because he's a presenter. Chair Galvin, while we're waiting, and I, I sent an email beforehand, but I, um, I'm under the weather and I have a doctor's appointment at 2.15, so I will have to log off a little bit early from the meeting, so I apologize ahead of time. No apology necessary, Mary. Hope you feel better. Okay, Chair Galvin, just to let you know, um, City Attorney Biggerstaff is now in Council Chamber. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call the meeting of the Board of Public Utilities for the City of Santa Rosa to order. If we may have a roll call, please. Thank you. Board Member Wright? Here. Board Member mm -hmm. Watts? Here. Board Member Walsh? Here. Board Member Grable? Here. Board Member Badenfort? Here. Vice Chair Noni? Here. Chair Galvin? Here. Let the record show that all members of the Board of Public Utility are present. Thank you, and just a reminder to the board members to please mute your phones and microphones when you're not speaking, and to put away all your cell phones and personal computers, and try and keep your video on. I also want to announce that item 8.1, which was a public hearing to adopt new miscellaneous fees 
and increasing certain miscellaneous fees is being continued to the December 15th, 2022 regular meeting. So we will not be holding a public hearing today. Next is uh, statements of abstentions by board members. Do we have any? All right, well, we have no study session. Uh, we have the minutes from the November 3rd meeting. So I'll open it up for public comment on item number 4.1. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Manis. Chair Galvin, there are no public comments from council chamber and I'm seeing no hands being raised via Zoom. And there are no pre-recorded public comments. Thank you, then the minutes will be adopted and, and entered. We'll now move to item 5.1, which is a water supply update. Director Burke. Thank you, Chair Galvin and members of the board. As mentioned, our first item is our water supply update and Deputy Director of Water Resources, Peter Martin, will be making the presentation. All right, good afternoon, uh, Chair Galvin and members of the board. Uh, very happy to be before you with another water supply update today. If we go ahead to go to the next slide. Um, yeah, just a quick update on Lake Pillsbury storage. Uh, storage still continues to remain uh, just below uh, the target storage for this time of year. Uh, to, just to remind the board, um, PG&E continues to operate under a variance from their FERC mandated flows. Um, those flows have been reduced down to a minimum of five, around five to 20 cubic feet per second of releases from uh, the project. Um, Pillsbury storage is continuing to decline, but not at such a rapid rate as over the last few months. Um, it's at, uh, I think the week over week change is about 161 acre feet. Um, it's very much expected that uh, pg e due to these storage conditions in Lake Pillsbury, will continue to operate under that variance uh, through the beginning of December. So, uh, and then also just a reminder that the, uh, the project continues to remain down and is anticipated to do so for the next couple of years uh, until they can make repairs to the uh, transformer bay uh, for the hydroelectric project. We did hear from Sonoma Water that, you know, their expectation is that that is gonna continue to impact uh, the storage of Lake Mendocino um, and they'll be relying very heavily on the water that comes from the watershed rather than uh, the typical bypass flows or actually the, the flows from the hydroelectric generation that have traditionally come in. So um, I can go ahead and go to the next slide. That's a good tie in to Lake Mendocino. Um, and as far as Lake Mendocino, uh, the current storage is about 37,500 uh, acre feet. Um, which is about you know, 68, 67% of their target water supply curve for this time of year. Uh, the outflow is about 25 cubic feet per second. So they've been able to reduce those flows uh, quite a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, it started to level off a little bit in terms of storage. Storage is uh, a little better, obviously, than in the last previous couple of years. Um, so, you know, they will potentially be able to carry over a little more storage this winter in hopes that it at some point it begins to rain. Um, and then uh, uh, the week over week change in storage is about uh, 66 cubic, or excuse me, 66 acre feet uh, storage uh, change, uh, lowering of storage over the last week. Uh, next slide. And then again, yeah, just um, conditions continue to be uh, challenging in terms of storage in Lake Sonoma. You know, it's about 41% uh, of the uh, storage pool uh, for Lake Sonoma. Uh, and I believe the storage as of today is just a little over 101,000 acre feet. Um, and the uh, pretty much daily losses in that reservoir are a little less than 200 acre feet per day. So you know, it's continuing to see declines in storage um, and, you know, just waiting for uh, that rainy weather. Um, and so, uh, you know, releases are about 100 cubic feet per second right now still uh, to maintain the minimum midstream flows in the lower watershed. Next slide. So, uh, you know, this graphic is updated every two weeks. 
Um, and you know, storage is actually lower than some of these figures at this point, but um, you know, definitely not, this kind of illustrates very much, in, especially in Lake Sonoma, as far as uh, Sonoma Waters Reservoirs, that they're seeing substantially less storage at this time um, compared to where they would be over the last 10 years. Uh, and so uh, we could go ahead and, you know, I just, I, actually I'll just, uh, you know, conclude with just, uh, you know, we're continuing to, you know, hope that this turns around a bit, but, you know, really starting out behind this year um, and, you know, some water is taking some proactive measures, which I'll talk a little bit more about in my presentation later in terms of their uh, management of the risk force. Next slide. Um, some good news in terms of our targets as a city. Uh, in the last month, Santa Rosa residents reduced their water use by 25% when compared to 2020. Excuse me, that says uh, June 2020. I apologize. That's October 2020. I just got that. Um, and then you know, saw, we saw the cumulative water use reductions uh, tick up by about 19%. Um, to, from 18%. So we did see uh, some gains in terms of our cumulative uh, reductions. And again, we uh, remain uh, in a 20% uh, mandatory reduction under stage three of our water shortage contingency plan. Um, and the community really is continuing to do everything they can to save water and, and get out there and we're, we're messaging that as much as possible. And we'll continue to do so uh, through this winter. Uh, next slide. So on October 28th, uh, we learned that Sonoma Water did file a temporary sea change petition. This is very much the exact same temporary sea change petition they uh, filed similarly last year at this time of year. Um, they obviously get these uh, orders over a term of 180 days. Um, and this existing order will be expiring on December 12th. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, they're anticipating continued reduced transfers of water from the Eel River via the Potter Valley project. Um, and so as a result, um, per the terms of their water rights contracts, they're requesting that the minimum in-stream flow requirements uh, be based on Lake Mendocino storage. Um, and that is opposed to the existing water rights, which uh, dictate that it's based on uh, cumulative inflow into Lake Pillsbury beginning January 1st. Uh, with that, uh, it's very likely they will have, you know, requesting the same terms, which include reporting, monitoring, uh, fishery conditions and water quality conditions as well as storage uh, monitoring and reporting as well. So, um, and then, you know, this obviously stipulates that there will be continued consultation with the fishery agencies, uh, the State Water Resource Control Board and the Regional uh, Water Quality Control Board uh, the difference is at this point, um, we concluded in October uh, the 20% uh, uh, reduced diversions requirement in the last order. Um, there won't be any requests for additional diversions uh, as it's uh, you know winter time. The expectation is that at some point natural flows will return. Um, but however, the contractors continue to have you know the the existing conservation measures in place and we'll continue to do so as well. Next slide. I just wanted to um, give a, a brief uh, update in this this figure here. We received a fish monitoring report from Sonoma Water at the most recent water advisory uh, committee meeting. An underwater video camera was installed uh, at Sonoma Water's Mirabelle Dam fish ladder on September 1st of this year. Um, this graphic is a little outdated, but um, I do have some updated figures at the beginning of November or this month, um, 185 uh, adult Chinook and nine coho salmon have been observed um, uh, as far as the fall run goes. You know, some of the water was said they were saying a slow start to the spawning migration this year. Uh, the Chinook salmon migration is triggered by rainfall uh, and so, you know, they need those increased flows typically to kick that off. So, uh, you know, obviously during times of drought, um, the migration is often delayed until uh, a decent amount of storms arrive. Um, but, and then, you know, furthermore, uh, the coho salmon do tend to return uh, slightly later than the Chinook salmon. Um, you know, they are more of a tributary spawner, so they're, they're much more 
uh, rely on that rainfall to access their habitat. So, um, you know, a lot of the lowest sections of the tributaries still sort of remain dry. So uh, until those dash flows return, um, we may not see many coho returning. Next slide. And then I just wanted to highlight, um, we're, we're very much booked out in terms of our uh, water audits and follow up regarding uh, turf replacement rebates until the end of the year. Um, but we are seeing uh, you know, a little bit of a, a lull in, in uh, customer calls and things like that. So we're, we're taking this opportunity to start to circle back with some of those folks that have recently participated in the Green Exchange Program uh, we're really looking for a variety of input on, uh, you know, their experiences, uh, how they uh, instituted their project, and, and really the intent is to try to find ways to maybe perhaps improve the programs, of course, and then look at ways to market things or maybe perhaps change the way we deliver our programs in the future. Um, so if we could go to, uh, excuse me, just uh, before we move on, um, you know, we're obviously asking them questions like if they're doing a lot of the work themselves, if they're utilizing contractors, and then really just um, some targeted questions about their customer service experience. Um, next slide. So uh, what we learned is that a lot of uh, the customers don't necessarily rely on a contractor for everything, but they do typically rely on a contractor to do a lot of the labor uh, in terms of the turf uh, removal. Um, but they, they, they tend to like to have a design and do some of the work uh, themselves in terms of plant selection and things like that. Um, we did see 19 of the 21 customers ranking the program as very excellent. Um, receives very good feedback uh, about how we deliver things. And, and we'll just continue to survey participants uh, and really just determine how we can continue to improve the program and see if there's other program opportunities uh, that we should be pursuing in the future. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, that, that's, that'll conclude my uh, water supply update and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Deputy Director Martin. Any questions or comments from the board? Very good, well, let's keep praying for rain. All right, that'll take care of, excuse me. Uh, let's now open it for public comment on item number 5.1. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Manis. Chair Galvin, there are no public comments for this item, Zoom or in person or in advance of the meeting. Thank you. We'll now move to item 5.2, uh, Director Burke. Thank you, Chair Galvin and members of the board. Item 5.2 is a staff briefing on project labor agreement overview and Assistant City Manager Jason Nutt will be making the presentation. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Galvin, members of the board. Uh, Jason Nutt, Assistant City Manager. Um, want to talk to you briefly about a program that we uh, at the City Manager's Office, City Attorney's Office, Public Works Department, Water Department, uh, and Economic Development Department have been working uh, on for the better part of this year, uh, which is the development of a project labor agreement. Um, at the beginning portion of this year, the Economic Development Subcommittee had requested that staff proceed with the evaluation and, and potential development of a project labor agreement policy. Uh, and staff took that initiative and began to uh, do research and develop um, some criteria that we ultimately ended up bringing forward to the council. Next slide, please. So the first idea was to try to better understand what the problem statement would be. I mean, what is it? What, what would the value of a project labor agreement be? Uh, and both the Economic Development Subcommittee and ultimately the council at their July 12, 22 sub, uh, study session uh, made an agreement that uh, there were three primary criteria or objectives that related to our problem statement. What is it? What was the value and the benefit of a project labor agreement? And we agreed that it would be successful if we could enhance our highly skilled local workforce and increase access to apprenticeship programs with the benefit of diversifying uh, our workforce, uh, providing greater equity and broader inclusion. 
Um, it also was a discussion about reducing the carbon footprint uh, within our community. And, and what that means is we want to keep that local workforce local. We don't want to export our local workforce elsewhere, nor do we want to import workforce from other communities. We want to keep the, the amount of carbon emissions relating to those operations as low as possible. And then lastly was to create that positive economic impact. Um, what that means is we are taking monies out of our capital improvement programs and we are giving it through contract services to local companies with the idea that those local companies and employees would reinvest in our community and create that circular economy. Those were the three primary objectives that we arrived at uh, and ultimately uh, provided to uh, the City Council during a July 12th study session. Next slide. During that presentation in, on July, uh, in July, during, uh, we, we went through a number of things, and that's predominantly what I want to do today. I just want to provide you with a little bit of an education about what a project labor agreement is. Um, under state law, we have certain contract provisions that, that guide and, and, re and require the city to implement our um, public works contracts with certain conditions, and you'll see a number of those up on the screen. Uh, project labor agreements do provide a higher level of work protection um, where you have work stoppages, strikes, lockouts, or other types of disruptions, uh, and it also um, more uniformly distributes the type of workforce or craft labor uh, that would be assigned to a particular project. So uh, that was one of the, the identified benefits of moving into a project labor agreement above and beyond our standard contract provisions uh, enforced by the state of California. Next slide. So to go into a little more detail, a project labor agreement is a collective bargaining agreement. It, it is, a, it is a, an agreement between the city, the contractors, and the unions to assign and specify the con work conditions associated with a particular project uh, that relate to the hiring and utilization of uh, unionizer signatory labor. Um, it does help in the governance between both the city, the contractor, and the labor uh, to ensure that proper work conditions exist and that uh, that labor is complying with the conditions of the job that they've been hired to do. Um, there are 18 unions uh, associated with North Bay Trades Council, which represents our region. Uh, those 18 unions have uh, been in contact with us through the course of this, uh, as well as communication we've had with the North Bay Trades. Uh, and so we're, we've been starting to develop policy and um, program based on those, those dialogues. Um, and you'll see some of the specifics that uh, project labor agreements uh, can be a benefit for. Next slide. If you look on the websites uh, of a number of different agencies that have gone through this process or you get onto the internet, you'll find that, that project labor agreements are, have a large laundry list of potential advantages and they have a large laundry list of potential disadvantages. Um, and that's why, that's part of the reason why the discussion of implementing a project labor agreement can be so controversial in a various organization because there, there is no clear path forward depending upon which agency you're looking at as your predominant guide. Um, what you see up here are snapshots that we pulled from the internet. These are not specific to our region. They're not specific to our organization. Um, but but they're just the types of feedback that we that we saw as we were doing our research relating to some of the pros and cons that we wanted to make sure we addressed through the course of this process. Uh, and uh, we feel we accomplished quite a bit of that as we prepared for our July 12th study session. Next slide. Another component of uh, project labor agreements, if you could advance one more slide, please. There we go. Uh, is 
um, a community workforce agreement. Uh, and that is a designation of a certain percentage of employees working for that particular contractor that live within the definition of local. Uh, you can see a couple of examples, the City of Los Angeles and the Port of Oakland at one point in time through the course of their project labor agreement policy adopted various levels that assign specific uh, local workforce requirements. The uh, community workforce agreement can also be more um, uh, minutely defined, where you can actually identify specific sectors of the population you want to focus on. You can you can go into a much more granular uh, into a granular definition, and there are organizations around the state that have taken that approach, where they want a certain percentage of veterans or a certain percentage of uh, of particular uh, classifications of groups uh, or the workforce. Um, and so we contemplated how we would incorporate this, and we did quite a bit of research to determine who our local labor force is. We both went to merit shops, merit shops being non-signatory or non-union shops, and we also looked at the unions that exist within our county, uh, and we asked for information from each of those shops to try to understand what the percentages of local labor is. And what we found in most cases is we're about 75% of all of our labor between whether merit or union live within um, within the five um, counties that we ultimately end up defining as local. Um, the good news of that is that means there's a healthy local workforce, whether signatory or merit, within our community. Next slide. So then, where did we end up with this? Um, so, so we ultimately had, took the final policy to the council on October 25th. Uh, we um, utilized data and feedback that we had received from the July 22 or the July 12th uh, study session uh, to make a presentation and a proposal to council. Uh, council made decisions uh, on the 25th that changed the proposal that staff presented. Uh, and what you see on the screen are criteria specifically designated by council uh, during that, um, oh, that final decision process. Uh, council expressed that they wanted a project labor agreement to apply to all capital projects, both vertical and horizontal. Horizontal are projects that you would see come to the Board of Public Utilities in most instances. They are water and sewer projects, um, they're storm drain projects. Um, vertical projects are what they sound like. They are projects that are above ground, um, at, but it could come in different forms. It could be an electrical project, it could be an HVAC project, it could be a construction of a pump station uh, or a reservoir. Those would all constitute vertical projects. In this particular instance, council described that they wanted all projects to uh, be in the application component. Staff following the conversation in July had originally represented to council we thought a $3 million threshold would be acceptable um, in order to establish uh, where a project labor agreement would apply to certain projects. Uh, during the council meeting on the 25th, council requested that staff set that threshold at $500,000. Uh, in this particular instance, what that means is all projects moving forward that are major public work as defined by the state of California uh, will ultimately be uh, have a project labor agreement applied to it. Um, what does that mean? That means that means all construction craft trade that are signatory or union affiliated um, will be incorporated into each of those projects, uh, consistent with the collective bargaining agreements that exist between uh, the unions, the contractors, and those particular uh, employees. As I mentioned before, we talked about the local definition of labor. Um, we knew that Santa Rosa and or Sonoma County in and of itself wasn't likely gonna have the density of unionized labor or quite frankly, even if we went and just talked about merit shops or non-unionized, probably didn't have the density that we needed in order to be able to focus uh, the concept of a local workforce agreement. And so uh, there was agreement by council that we would establish a five county definition of local. Uh, that, that incorporates Sonoma, Marin, Napa, Lake, and Mendocino counties. 
uh, and we felt that that seemed reasonable when we looked at the data. Uh, that encompassed what I mentioned earlier, which is a fairly significant percentage of the workforce. Council did agree that starting off with a lower percentage uh, within the contract agreement or within the project labor agreement was a good starting spot. And so we, uh, Council approved a 30% local workforce hiring requirement. So that means any contract that comes forward under a project labor agreement would have 30% of the, of the labor have zip codes within those five counties. Um, during our research over the course of the last six months, we don't think that's going to be a difficult threshold. In fact, we think the, the threshold could have been higher, but this is a great starting spot for us to get our feet wet as we start to learn and develop more uh, what that project labor agreement ultimately will mean for us. Next slide. We did talk about the potential of an escalation factor, and when we were thinking about a set dollar amount, as we had originally presented at the three million, you know, with inflation, costs continue to go up, and what we didn't want to see was that the cost and threshold vary over the course of time simply because of inflation. And so our initial recommendation was to establish and set the threshold associated with, uh, with an inflator. Um, given the fact that the council adjusted that threshold to such a low level um, and applied all projects to it, in essence, uh, we don't necessarily feel that uh, a threshold is necessary uh, at this point in time, and we'll be addressing that uh, along the way uh, with council if we feel that there is an issue that ends up arriving over the course of time. Um, we had originally proposed uh, an initiation period for uh, the PLA in 2024. Uh, council requested that we start that earlier uh, with a, a implement by July 1st, 2023. Uh, and then instead of a three-year turnaround, as staff requested, they uh, requested that we move forward with a five-year revisit cycle. Um, it is not a sunset date. It is merely a revisit cycle, which means council would like more information. They'd like feedback, and they'd like some data that documents uh, how we're doing with project labor agreements. Um, we fully intend to provide feedback along the way. We're not going to be waiting the full five years before we provide council with any feedback. Uh, but that would be the time with which if staff had substantive change that we wanted to incorporate, we would come back and provide it at that time. Lastly, uh, we had requested a series of exemptions uh, that we felt would help um, the utilization of uh, our knowledge when it comes to local contractors and the type of contract work that we have. Um, council asked us to streamline that, and so we did. Uh, there are uh, just a few exemptions that exist, and those exemptions exist in certain forms. So, for example, if we have an emergency or an exigent circumstance where we have to act immediately or we uh, stand public health risk, um, we have the opportunity to enter into a contract above that $500,000 that would get us uh, into a safe position or condition. Um, if we have state, federal, or local funds that have restrictions or timelines that don't conform with the process associated with project labor agreements, or if we actually have legislation that prohibits the use of project labor agreements, uh, we're also given the authority to be able to make um, an exemption associated with that. Uh, and lastly, there is a component, you'll see negative impact on project delivery. Um, that was a little bit old language that I transferred over from slides, but that primary goal there is if there is a lack of unionized density for any specific project type, then the city manager has the authority to uh, exempt that project from the utilization of our project labor agreement. And so um, these are some of the conditions that have been incorporated uh, into the policy. Um, the attorney's office is actively working on finalizing the feedback that they heard from council. Uh, so these are just some of the high points uh, and not necessarily the level of detail that we'll ultimately be able to see over the course of the next several weeks uh, as we finalize that, uh, that direction that we were given from council. Um, our hope is that this is uh, of limited impact uh, to our staff and to our contract community uh, and that we're able to implement this 
uh, in a way that allows us to continue to proceed delivering all of the projects that we know are currently on the books and into the future without any additional delay or cost. Uh, and so with that, um, uh, Chair Galvin, uh, that is the end of my presentation. Next slide, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Assist Assistant City Manager Nutt. I'll open it up now for board member questions or comments. A question, Mr. Chairman? Vice Chair Anoni. Um, thank you, Mr. Nutt. I, I like the way you started the presentation with a statement of problems, uh, the problem statement, and trying to do what's, what are we trying to achieve here? That makes sense to me, and and I like the, the three that you picked out: a positive inc economic impact, reducing carbon footprint, and increasing skilled workforce. All makes sense. My question is, how are we going to monitor those things and track whether or not this experiment, well, this this project is 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 whether it's achieving its intended goals or not? Vice Chair, great questions. Uh, these are things that that we are going to be working on developing procedure for along the way. Uh, until we have a defined and completed template on what the project labor agreement looks like and know how that's going to um, be incorporated into our contract processes, it's going to be harder to understand how we're going to track some of these components. Um, but having talked with some of uh, the other partner agencies out there who have implemented uh, there are mechanisms for us to be able to get information from the contractor uh, about the type of the workforce, where the workforce comes from, um, the type and number of apprentices, for example, that may exist on a project. Uh, and it will allow, and, and there are other aspects relating to some of the training organizations. Um, we have an outstanding local unionized trade training center here, um, and that particular organization um, is more than happy to provide us with feedback and information about the number of, uh, of individuals they have coming through their program, how they're expanding, where they're going, uh, and it's going to be in our best interest to try to help partner uh, to the best of our ability to make sure that those apprenticeship opportunities and the pre-apprenticeship training programs continue to expand. So, so Vice Chair, it's, it is a, a work in progress. We don't have a defined metric monitoring program at this point in time, but we will be developing one over the next couple of years. Member Watts, or are you waving goodbye? Okay, feel better. Any other board member? Uh, board member Wright, please. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm just curious: uh, will this uh, impact uh, non-union contractors uh, when bidding on our projects? And uh, secondly, um, I'm curious. Um, you know, forever we. Uh, wrote out uh, arbitration in our contracts. Uh, we did not allow arbitration. And why? Why is that back in there? I'm just curious what the thinking is on that. Thank you, Thank you Board Member Wright. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll answer the uh, couple of questions in different ways. Um, so when it comes to the arbitration, I'm going to defer that, and we can get back to you uh, on how we're going to make those. Um, uh, Assistant City Attorney Mullen has been our predominant counsel on this, uh, and I can ask her to, once we have a final document or we're getting close to a final document, it would be much easier for us to come back and describe some of the definitive details associated with how this will be implemented. Um, right now, you know, we're looking at still high level uh, issues. Uh, we have primary criteria, um, but we don't have the nuanced or detailed information. That's something that's still in the works. So I uh, so just want to you know we'll, we'll return with the information about um, how we're gonna how we're going to incorporate um, disputes and discussions along the way between the the three parties. And I, I'm sorry, can you re repeat your first question? Impact on. Non-union impact yeah. on non-union. Uh, you know, um, I think that's to some extent unknown, and you'd get a different answer depending upon which organization you asked. Uh, if you asked the merit contractors, they would tell you this is going to be a substantial impact. And there were a few speakers during the council meeting on the 25th that did talk to that. Um, if you spoke with the uh, trades council, they would explain that non-signatory non companies have the opportunity, as do signatory companies, to bid on a project. Uh, there is a mechanism with which 
a non-unionized uh, employee would join a union during the course of that project uh, in order to comply with the project labor agreement. And so there is a mechanism for a non-signatory company to participate and to bid on those projects, uh, whether or not that works for that particular company is is up to that particular company but uh, it doesn't there's nothing that specifies that a non-signatory company can't submit a bid on a project board member grable hi thank you for the presentation um, I, my question would be how many of the I know it's a substantial uh, number, but how many of the overall projects uh, that we're talking about fall under the authority of Santa Rosa Water and the Board of Public Utilities? Just at, roughly. So, so typically about 60%, 60 to 70% of our capital program is uh, relates to the water enterprise and would fall under the authority of the Board of Public Utilities. And that will remain unchanged. The project labor agreement doesn't actually change the award authority. Uh, all of those will continue to come to the Board of Public Utilities. And that includes projects where there's both uh, the capital improvement on the water and sewer infrastructure side, but then also the public works and paving uh, that is contiguous with that project or included in that project? That, that's correct. Okay. And currently, I just, I'm curious, because I know that um, this was sort of a funny coincidence at the SRJC where uh, right contracting, for instance, did a lot of both the non-PLA and PLA projects, and um, it, it became apples to apples for, for as far as that contractor. But um, it, in our experience, how many non-union or merit-based contractors would you say percentage wise are typically responding to our requests uh, requests for um, for bids and proposals you know uh, board member Grable I actually don't have that information I, I can tell you that there are uh, some of the largest contractors that produce a majority of the work for us are all signatory contractors uh, and even though they have not operated or bid under a project labor agreement for us um, the incorporation of a project labor agreement doesn't impact their ability to continue to, to bid on our projects. And so uh, as far as percentage split between them, I, I really I don't have that information. We didn't go into that level of detail. Um, so I, I apologize for that. No, no, I understand. And, you know, we get I know we get a lot of responses from local contractors like Argonaut and uh, Gelati and, and what and just to and I know that they're signatories and most of the larger are. The, the reason I asked the question, I, I know it was last year or the year before that we had a sort of an issue with, um, the, across the sector, we were having an issue with how many uh, responses we were getting to our um, to our requests, our RFPs um, for different capital projects. And, it, and we, I think there was a Nexus study as well, just, comparatively about you know why regionally we seem to have a lower number of respondents um, to our RFPs and projects than, than maybe other like jurisdictions and that's the only reason I brought it up because I, I I'd be interested to, to see it doesn't sound like it will impact that um, and so it, it's just something that's on my mind though you know while we're doing this can we be working to also on that uh, on that um, the outcomes-based uh, questions we had before about respondents, can we be working on that to make sure we're, we're still getting a competitive number of respondents on those RFPs, which it sounds like we will be. Yeah, Board Member Grable, that, that is that's something we're interested in and we're going to keep track of. Uh, intuitively, you know, we have heard that the incorporation of project labor agreements in most organizations did ultimately provide or it, it result in some reduction in the total number of bidders by project. Um, whether or not that was consequential is really the question. Uh, and so we would anticipate that if we had 10 uh, before the action, uh, we may have eight 
uh, moving forward. Again, there, there's no specific number. We don't have that information because we really haven't gone through this process, uh, but we do expect some attrition uh, in the total number. One, because of the PLA conditions of being a signatory uh, corp, uh, company, but also the condition of a community workforce uh, agreement where we're requiring a certain percentage of local employees. Um, we've been told that that's not necessarily uh, a huge issue for out-of-the-area corporations uh, because they do usually hire a substantial number of local subs. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, we we would we will be tracking this moving forward so that we have more detail uh, when we come back to council in a few years. That's great. And and just on a, one more specific cost question, it it sounds like most of our capital projects or that most of the city's capital projects. The, the vast majority land in like the what the 1.5 million dollar range um do we know just on the water on sr water side um do we have any projects below 500,000 the, the threshold just it, I, I was a little um uh, confused by the why they landed on that threshold amount um and where the majority of the projects land versus maybe the higher dollar projects, you know, like, for instance, the the UV system that we just put in, which is, I think, a little different in terms of the project typology. But um, do we know how, just within SR Water, what's the average? What would you say is the average cost of our typical like project if you if you're doing a mean average? Yeah, uh, Board Member Grable, I actually don't have that data. What I would say is when we did our research, there are very few um, water-oriented projects that will fall below the $500,000 threshold. Uh, most of those we already operate as small public works projects or minor projects, uh, and we have different authority to move those forward. So um, it, with the half a million dollar threshold, it will impact nearly all uh, large major uh, projects for Centers of Water. And when you say the small, sorry to get into the weeds on this, but I think it's that's that's the nature of the of the sausage, right? Um, but the those small uh, projects that you mentioned, do we just do those in house with our own staff? Is that? How does work? No, we can issue a minor public works contract. And so, for example, if we had to replace a boiler uh, over at the treatment plant, that particular project's likely under $380,000, and therefore uh, we would issue under uh, minor public works, which is more expedited methodology um, and would not uh, would not be would not conform with the public the project labor agreement policy. Okay. Thank you for the, the detailed answers. I appreciate it. Thanks. Board Member Walsh. Thank you, Chairman Kelvin. Um, it's a couple of comments and then may, maybe one one question. Um, the, the first is I appreciate the degree of difficulty um, that Assistant City Manager Nutt and uh, Deputy City Attorney Mullen um, had in this project in navigating the formulation of the policy. So this one is definitely without, it's not without uh, people having opposite views and perspectives of whether whether or not it should be undertaken. And so I just want to appreciate the degree of difficulty of their work and uh, their uh, their method of navigating this through. And the second comment is um, the, the BPU, as far as our scope and our, our limits, um, you know, looking at, at the city charter, uh, section 25C, we're limited to awarding contracts under the procedures adopted by the city council. So. You know, although we, we don't really get that much of a shot in, in affecting this policy itself, I just wanted to to put that out there. But we we have to, you know, we're going to implement it because we have to work. And then that leads to the question of uh, of timing on our projects. I think we have some constituents, uh, specifically Mr. Harder, that spoke to us about the you know the timing of projects and how we get things done. I just wanted to ask staff: Is there is there mechanisms or methods we're looking at implementing this um, so that the policy when in its final form um, doesn't affect our ability to get stuff done in a timely manner. Are we going to have kind of pre-approved methods or are we going to need to go out earlier? Um, is there anything that we need to do to help navigate that? 
thank you, Board Member Walsh. I, I will say I, I, I feel fairly confident in, in stating that the first two, three, or four projects that go out under a project labor agreement are going to take more time. Um, as it's a new procedure, it's going to be new for staff, it's going to be new for our contracting community within our, at least the way we're going to be implementing it. Um, it's going to take time up front to be able to make sure that we've crossed all our T's and dotted our I's in advance of awarding those contracts. Once those first few go through and we work out whatever kinks may exist or whatever road, you know, whatever stumbling blocks we may have, my belief is it will be smoother from that point forward because it will be part of the routine and I think we'll be back on track as far as being able to deliver projects in a concise way. Um, we don't have specifics. I can't tell you what level of delay uh, will occur um, or quite frankly if it will. My gut feeling based on the feedback and the, D and the research we did will show that, you know, show that at least the first few are going to um, cause some level of of delay just because it's a new process for us. Uh, but our hope is everything will be smooth moving forward. Um, and, I, and I will say there's a high level of credit to Assistant City Attorney Mullen. She did a fantastic job um, bringing together a lot of complex legal issues. It's one thing for me to be on the public work side and understanding the implementation component, but the legal side of this is, is uh, equally as complicated. Uh, and um, when we have more of a detailed product uh, that's ready to roll out, I would love to give her the opportunity to come and talk, you, talk to you about that specific aspect. Uh, of of the project labor agreement implementation. Well, I very much appreciate your ability to carry this big administrative load. Thank you for your work. Thanks. Other board member questions or comments? Board member Badenfort. Uh, thank you, uh, and for the presentation and the detail. Um, I agree with my my colleagues on the the gratitude for the uh, the thoughtfulness. Uh, in this entire process, um, forgive me if um, if I heard it incorrectly, but it sounded like they're either uh, staff or uh, whether it was stakeholder uh, input that requested a, a handful of things that may not have been incorporated um, as this kind of went back to went to council. Whether it was around the ramp up time, the time to revisit different exemptions, which I assume were proposed um, for, for, for a reason. Um, and I, as a, as a non-contractor myself, if we zoom all the way out, um, what concerns are you really watching for? Uh, how will we know, uh, you know, what pitfalls do you see for us? Obviously, the nature of our work is in many ways, public safety and many, in many ways, vital services. We have very long, uh, substantial projects that 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 are multi-year projects that may even kind of get caught up in some timing here, um, and I and I understand that there's a a, a five-year uh, return to 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 reconsider, I guess, and the data and the reporting that happens along the way. So uh, certainly not saying that the that the BBU should be proposing changes to to anything before then, but it. It does strike me that it does seem to be quite a substantial uh, change uh, for a substantial period of time for the department that has the most substantial amount of contracts in the city. And so I guess broadly speaking, I'm, I'm interested in how can we, at least as a board, have a good understanding more consistently than every five years about how is this affecting our ability to be able to serve our customers um, and maintain uh, a safe and reliable uh, water supply to our customers in our city uh, along the way and to be able to really provide straightforward, meaningful uh, reporting and data back uh, to council uh, more often. So thank you. Thank, thank, thanks, Board Member Battenford. I, I will say that um, I have no concerns about the quality of workmanship based on the implementation of a project labor agreement. Uh, whether it's the contractors we've already been working with that will be working under the union lens as opposed to the merit lens, um, it's the same group of individuals and the same employees. Uh, 
I have a high level of confidence in the level of in the skilled workforce that exists under the trades. Uh, I think that that craft labor is skilled. I think that they have the talent to be able to continue to progress our capital uh, improvements and get projects built in a very quali in a high quality way. Where we don't know and where we have some concern is the increased time of delivery not from the contracting side, but from the initial contract preparation side, mm -hmm. uh, and the potential cost increase associated with uh, project labor agreements. Those are the two areas that I think um, we're utilizing and collecting feedback and information from partner agencies that have gone through this before. Uh, we're interpolating materials that we're reading uh, from many of those agencies. Uh, and we're going to be working with our local entities to try to better understand what those could be so that as we start to prepare for the upcoming capital improvement program, um, that we're incorporating our best information at this point in time. Um, I would expect and I believe we will likely be returning not only to the council but the BPU uh, at least on an annual basis as part of the capital improvement program to be able to describe uh, whether there's been any challenges, concerns, uh, or where we're at from a statistical standpoint. So uh, I think you can be assured that we will not wait five years before you hear uh, how this um, new program implementation is going to uh, benefit or impact our organization. Thank you very much. And if, if I could just add, um, uh, Board Member Badenport, thank you for your question. And, um, and as Assistant City Manager Nutt mentioned, um, my intent and uh, part of that is based on when we have a permanent uh, uh, director in the Transportation and Public Works Department, but um, been having discussions about uh, having uh, actual semi-annuals updates on CIP to the board. And so we'll incorporate um, any information we learn and things that we're tracking uh, as part of those updates to the board so that you're aware. Um, my hope is that at sort of the, the beginning of the season and the end of the construction season in general, we can have updates to the board. So that, that's my intent going forward. It's just uh, hopefully we'll get there soon. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Other board member questions or comments? I too would like to applaud the work that's been done by the city manager's office and the city attorney's office. Um, very disappointed that the staff recommendations weren't followed. I have to tell you that I'm against project labor agreements. I'm on the board at the North Coast Builders Exchange. We've been studying PLAs for over 10 years, a lot of statistical data. We have members in the Builders Exchange that are both union and non-union, and the exchange came out eight, 10 years ago opposing project labor agreements. The union dues that get paid for non-union members don't end up in the non-union members' pocket at the end. The PLAs have not been proven to lower costs. Um, it's just, it's disappointing that this threshold of 500K uh, was used and I'm hoping that it'll get revisited uh, by a new city council or a new mayor. Any other board member questions or comments? If not, we'll take public comments on item 5.2. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Manis. Chair Galvin, we do not have anyone in council chamber wishing to make a public comment, but we do have a hand raised via Zoom. Joe will be the first public comment. Joe, your public or your permissions to speak have been enabled. Please unmute your mic. Oh, hello, um, my name is Joe Lubis. <clears throat> I am a policy analyst with Associated Builders and Contractors Northern California Chapter. And I just actually had a, a, a two questions for uh, Assistant City Manager Nutt. Um, you, it said that there was a no discrimination, like union membership was not a requirement to work. Um, I'm just wondering, does that mean that apprentices don't have to come from union apprenticeship programs and there's no core workforce requirement for unions? Uh, 
and uh, I'm also just wondering um, that he said 75% of workers come from five counties. I'm wondering what percentage actually come from Sonoma County. Uh, just, uh, yeah, those are things that need to be, those are questions that need to be cleared up when they say that it's, it's a local workforce and that there's no uh, bias towards unions. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Um, Assistant City Manager Neff, did you want to respond? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Galvin. I, so the, the statement relating to union affiliation is that there is a mechanism for a merit shop or a merit employee to uh, participate in a PLA-oriented or approved project. Uh, it does require that that employee participate and pay dues for that union that, that is performing the work. Um, it does not so there, it doesn't necess, it doesn't keep them from doing the work. They just have to perform the work under certain conditions relating to the to the project labor agreement terms. Um, and so, as far as the percentage of the local workforce, I don't have the data that specifies how many are Sonoma County. We do recognize that within Sonoma County, as I mentioned early in the in the. Uh, presentation, we felt that Sonoma County was too narrow of a focus for the de definition of local uh, and that we needed to uh, grow beyond that in order to determine what a local workforce uh, looked like for us. Uh, and so that was the reason why we brought that specific definition to council for approval. Thank you. Do we have any other public comments, Secretary Manis? We do not, Chair. Okay, that will conclude item 5.2. We'll now move to the consent calendar. We have two items on the consent calendar. I'll move adoption of the consent calendar. Second. Second. I have a motion by Vice Chair Arnone, seconded by Board Member Grable. Uh, do we have any comments or questions from the board? If not, we'll open it up for public comments on items 6.1 and 6.2. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Manis. There are no public comments on the consent calendar. Very good. May we have a roll call vote, please? Thank you. Board Member Wright? Aye. Board Member Watts has left the meeting. Board Member Walsh? Aye. Board Member Grable? Aye. Board Member Benfort? Aye. Vice Chair Arnone? Aye. Chair Galvin? Aye. Let the record show this vote passed with six affirmative, or this consent motion passed with six affirmative votes. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to item 7.1, which is a report item. Director Burke? Thank you, Chair Galvin and members of the board. Item 7.1 is a contingency increase for contract number C02105, Laguna Treatment Plant Chillers and Climate Control Upgrades at Administration and Annex Building. And Tracy Duenas, uh, Supervising Engineer with our Capital Projects team, will be making the presentation. sound check make sure everybody can hear me loud and clear great thank you good afternoon chair galvin uh, members of the board my name is tracy duena supervising engineer with capital projects engineering today i bring before you the report item uh, contingency increase for contract co2105 laguna treatment plant chillers and climate control upgrades at administration and annex buildings next slide please Uh, so today I'll briefly outline the project background um, and analysis and close with a recommendation. Next slide, please. So back in December of 2016, uh, the city acquired uh, a, from Costa Engineers, a report titled the Chiller, Water Chiller Assessment. Uh, the, intent, the intent of this assessment was ultimately determine 
the condition of the existing water chillers serving the plants admin and annex buildings. Um, chillers, in essence, remove water, um, re remove heat from water and via a heat exchange process that essentially produces cool air that in effect can be distributed through the ventilation system. So Costa uh, analyzed and with consideration to uh, the building's uh, equipment, age, efficiency, um, physical condition, um, and noise. Um, the assessment concluded that the uh, existing chillers um, had reached their effective design life and thus uh, full recommendation for full replacement was uh, proceeded and recommended. So um, in essence, this assessment was a partial basis for the project in itself. Next slide, please. So the project consists of, um, pursuant to the assessment, a replacement of one 50-ton chiller serving the annex building, um, two 50-ton chillers serving the admin building, and then two boilers and the programmable logical control system within the admin building. Um, the boilers uh, provide basically a mechanism for heating the domestic water and the programmable logic controllers, if you will, they're the engine that provides the means for system um, automation for the various equipment. Uh, next slide, please. So this history, uh, this project, excuse me, has had uh, previous history with before the board dating back to August of 2019. Uh, in 2019, we brought before the sole source specification for the Seaman, Siemens type PLC equipment um, as required for the project. The board approved it then, uh, moving to October 2019. Uh, we proceeded with approve, bringing forth the construction contract uh, in the amount of $873,216, along with a 15% contingency uh, in the amount of $130,982 uh, to the lowest bidder, Matrix HD in Novato. The board approved that. And then in November of 2019, we issued the notice to proceed uh, for the project. Um, well, with uh, the emergence and the response to COVID-19, we put the project on temporary suspension um, approximately from March through May of 2020 via um, a force majeure change order. And then in July 2020, we brought again to the board uh, an approved recommendation for a subcontractor addition uh, for Wonderlick Wonderla Malik Engineering um, for the work specific to the climate controls upgrade portion of the project. Uh, next slide, please. So between March and October of 2020, six contract changes were effectively executed, amounting in the total of approximately 77,000 amongst those six, uh, which left approximately 53 and change, $53,000 remaining in available balance. Um, of the cumulative 77,000 spent in those six change orders, approximately 50, 3% were uh, related to design modifications um, or requests internally. 40% uh, was attributable design oversight and the remaining seven was a result from unforeseen conditions. So in July of that, uh, July of 2020, also the contractor matrix submitted uh, a potential change order uh, that claimed the contract documents were um, deficient specifically with regards to the climate control portion of the scope of work. Uh, next slide, please. So leading up to March of 2021, city staff, um, along with plant operators, um, the design engineer and the construction manager, all collaboratively um, proceeded with analyzing and reviewed the validity of the contractor's assertions um, uh, with um, extensive research um, and investigative efforts primarily around the existing climate existing climate control network, um, its processes and the system operations. Ultimately, the findings did confirm that the contracts did uh, were incomplete and did lack specifics um, primarily with the uh, climate control element. So with that, um, we did request an additional scope of work, which included adding three additional uh, PLC controller equipments, um, an interface panel, 
um, additional programming and software, um, as well as operating manuals. So this was all memorialized in uh, contract change order seven, specifically just for PLC scope. That PLC, uh, excuse me, that change order um, approximately was in the amount of 86,000. Um, at the time, our current approved balance was approximately $53,000. Um, so staff brought before the board a request for additional 15% contingency, and it was approved by the board in March of 2021. <clears throat> so between March and October, uh, four change orders were executed. I show six on that. I apologize, just four were executed. Uh, one, that, one being um, the change order seven. So seven through 10 were executed. Um, between all four of those, they accumulated approximately $166,000, which left approximately 18,000 remaining in available balance. In review um, of the 166,000 that was spent, um, a majority of 70% of that was attributable to change order seven, um, as well as residual work or impacts resulting from the added PLC work, um, as well as granting the contractor an additional 230 days to the, to the project. So 18% um, of that money spent uh, was also attributable to other design modifications and the remaining was uh, due to unforeseen conditions. Next slide, please. So in July of this year, um, the contractor submitted another potential claim uh, specific to additional programming efforts. Uh, the contractor this time asserted that through what is known as a sequence of operation process, which is essentially an effort undertaken to define um, how the system will function through its uh, operating modes, um, that multiple clarifications, uh, multiple resubmittals occurred over the course of essentially this past year, which resulted in ultimately uh, multiple PL PLC reprogramming efforts, which um, after the analysis showed that was essentially above and beyond, which is typically industry standard for this type of work or submittal processes. So um, with that, uh, leading up to last month, October of 2020, um, staff, including the design engineer and, and the construction manager, we went through another uh, effort to um, analyze, uh, review, and validate these assertions and ultimately did find that the extra work was legitimate as a result of the extended sequence of operation processes that also uh, more or less primarily involved this new integration uh, into an existing system that has been de developed over multiple phases out of the plant uh, over multiple years, multiple projects at different buildings um, some of which have, in some cases, minimal, if no ag uh, existing as built as reference. So the scope of the work uh, in question is approximately $21,000. Um, it is memorialized in the pending change order 11. Um, currently, there is approximately $18,000 remaining contingency, and the need is approximately 35,000, which puts the overall author, authorized balance uh, in the um, approximately ne uh, negative $16,000 in available balance. Um, with this, because the work, uh, although not all fully complete, um, is partially done, um, the work uh, is deemed as uh, an administrative change order to the extent that it does exceed the authorized amount. Um, in all to date, uh, approximately, accumulatively speaking, f over 50% of the contingency spent um, is related to the additional PLC work or residual impacts caused by the additional PLC work. Next slide, please. So uh, pursuant to council policy 100-07, essentially a, a administrative change order is a change order to a public work contract, which does not change the scape, scope of work or the intent of the contract as awarded by the award, original award authority. 
uh, administrative change orders may include extra work required for the proper completion, essentially, of the project. Next slide, please. And further, uh, I'm sorry, last, if you could back up one last one. And further, if an administrative change order exceeds the funds available within the authorized contract amount, it shall be returned to the award, original award authority for approval, in this case, the Board of Public Utilities. Next slide, please. So it is recommended by the Transportation and Public Works Department and the Water Department that the Board of Public Utilities by motion pursuant to council policy number 100-07 approve an administrative change order and approve a 5% contingency increase of $43,660.80 for contract number CO2105 Laguna, Laguna Treatment Plant chillers and climate control upgrades at administration and annex building for the total amount one million one hundred and seventy eight thousand eight hundred and forty one dollars and sixty cents next slide um, with that i i'd be uh, open and would love to hear any questions if you have i do have uh the project's construction manager in the event uh, i need uh, additional uh, support thank you mr duanis we'll open it up now for board member questions and comments board member walsh thank you chair gelman uh, just a comment. I appreciate the specificity um, in which Supervisor Engineer Duenas has been walking us through this, the project backgrounds in the past. This is a very large project and managing, seems like the scope of the scope of work, the, the timing of the deliverables, and then the resources required. Um, uh, I think it's a very admirable job. And so generally, I'm much, much in support of uh, of the recommendations of uh, Engineer Duenas and, uh, and our Water Director. Um, so that's Thank my you. own comment, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Walsh. Other comments from the Board or questions? Uh, yes, Board Member Wright. Yeah, I also support this. Uh, I just know from my own experience about the uh, HVAC at the, uh, at the plant, uh, it's been a headache is for as long as I can remember. And it seems like it just continues to be one. Uh, and uh, so uh, I guess I'll say I feel your pain and I will support uh, this uh, this modification. Thank you. If there's no other board member questions or comments, how about uh, board member Wright making a motion? Yeah, I'll be happy to make a motion to increase uh, the contract uh, contingency by 5% uh, for the Laguna Treatment um, Administration chillers and various pertinences. Second. We have a second motion by Board Member Wright, and I believe a second by Board Member Walsh. At this time, we'll open it up for public comment. If you wish to make a comment on item 7.1, please uh, raise your hand via Zoom. Or if you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Manis, do we have anyone? We have no public comments for this item, Chair. Thank you. May we have a roll call vote, please? Thank you, Board Member Wright. Aye. Board Member Walsh. Aye. Board Member Grable. Aye. Board Member Badenfort. Aye. Vice Chair Arnone. Aye. Chair Galvin. Aye. Let the record show this motion passes with six affirmative votes. Thank you again, Mr. Duenas. Thank you. That'll conclude uh, item 7.1. As I announced at the beginning of the meeting, item 8.1, which was to be a public hearing to adopt new miscellaneous fees and increasing certain miscellaneous fees is being continued to the December 15, 2022 regular meeting. We'll move to item nine, public comments on non-agenda matters. We're now taking public comments on item nine. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Manis. There are no public comments on non-agenda matters. Thank you. We have no referrals. We have no written communications. I believe Director Burke, you're gonna give a budget review subcommittee report. Thank you, Chair Galvin. Actually, Board Member Wright uh, is available to give that report. Oh, great. 
Yes, uh, in the absence of uh, board member Watts, I will give the uh, budget uh, review subcommittee report. So the budget uh, review subcommittee met on November 7th to receive an update on proposed changes to the miscellaneous fees. The subcommittee provided feedback and direct direction to staff. The subcommittee will meet again prior to the, uh, the public hearing on miscellaneous fees, which is being continued to December 15th. And that's my report. Thank you, board member Wright. Any questions or comments from the board? One, one comment, Chair Galvin. Sure. Uh, I appreciate considering the, the item later. And uh, I was, a, as a member of the subcommittee, I attended the meeting. And I uh, just wanted to, to say to staff that my comments during that meeting um, weren't positive enough, but were more insistent that we do things a particular way. I apologize. Um, normally, I want to have a positive inquiry method and I didn't have enough detail to make a decision, uh, but I certainly uh, support and approve of staff's uh, quality of work. And so I should have indicated that during the meeting. I didn't, and I apologize for failing to do that. Thank you, Board Member Walsh. Any other board member questions or comments regarding the subcommittee report? All right, if not, we will take public comments on item number 11, if you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Manis. There are no public comments on subcommittee reports. Thank you. Do we have any board member reports? Doesn't appear so. We will move then to the director's report, item 14. Thank you, Chair Galvin and members of the board. I have two items to share with you this afternoon. Uh, first, I wanted to let the board know that the epidemiological studies of our water, our waste, pardon me, our wastewater are continuing to provide a wealth of community health data. We are starting to see much less COVID uh, than in the peak, but we are seeing rapid increases in both uh, respiratory, sensential sens virus, I knew they were gonna do that to me, or RSV, and influenza A. Uh, this information is uh, shared, we do share it with the County Department of Public Health, and they've used it to direct their outreach to the public and local health care providers. Uh, you probably recently saw some information about uh, respiratory illnesses that uh, the local uh, health officer was providing to the public. Um, and also, our regulators are very interested in this data, and water department staff will be presenting the latest results of these studies to our North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board at their meeting scheduled for December 8th and 9th. So a very nice kudos to staff uh, for their work on this and uh, being invited to present to our regulators. And then second, I wanted to uh, let the board know that on November 14th, uh, the North Coast Regional Water Control, Control Board staff came out to the Laguna treatment plant and conducted an inspection of the plant, the Meadow Lane Pond Complex, and our Delta Pond. The inspection went very well, and uh, I do want to note that the inspector commented that he appreciated staff's dedication to meeting our permit requirements and that there were no findings from the visit. Um, we are continuing to find ways to work with our regulators to meet our common goal of being stewards of water quality in our watershed. And in particular, I want to compliment our environmental services division, as well as our treatment plant operations staff for their great work and especially for their work being noticed and acknowledged by the regional board staff. Uh, to have them come out and do an inspection and really have no findings is pretty remarkable. Um, and that is my uh, update and my report, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Thank you for the report, and that's great news with regards to the inspection. Uh, any board member questions or comments? Uh, board member Grable? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Director Burke. Um, 
think I messaged you a while ago asking uh, about the uh, monitoring data. And it's certainly been helpful for me and my family just to inform our own decisions about how to protect the family. And um, certainly seeing the, uh, the reality of that data reflected in uh, my daughter's classroom attendance, which has, is about half what it should be. Um, but it's just really fantastic that we have that, that data now, both from the Verily and the BioBot. Um, that's what a, you know, what an amazing 21st century public health improvement to have that data. Um, so thank you again. Thank you, board member Grable. Any other board member questions or comments for the director? All right, we'll now take public comments on item 14. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Secretary Manis. There are no public comments for director's report. That will take care of the director's report then, which brings us to item 15, which is an adjournment of the meeting. So we will be adjourned. I wish you all a happy Thanksgiving, safe travels if you're traveling and we will see you in December. So we are adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair.